Hi, everybody. Hi. So this is the annual National Honor Society Awareness Day. We've done several things over the past years that you have watched. We used, we've done AIDS awareness. We've done mental health awareness. Uh, last year, we did addiction awareness. And this year, because it's Acadia's 100th birthday, we felt really compelled to celebrate our beloved park. And when I asked the kids, we in NHS, we divide into committees and we do different projects. And there was a group of kids who signed on to do the awareness project, which is this. And once we decided that we wanted to talk about Acadia with you, I asked the kids what they wanted their friends to know about Acadia, because I didn't want it to be my project, it was their project. And they brainstormed, and they made a list, and then they narrowed down the list, and they came up with four things that they wanted their friends, you people, to know. They wanted you to understand something about the history of Acadia, so we have, Bill's going to talk about the history, and we're going to animate that for you. They wanted you to understand the significance that science and scientists have played and will continue to play and the role that climate change has on the park. They wanted you to understand what opportunities there are for you to volunteer and be stewards of the park and also potential employment in the park. And then they really wanted you to understand the significance and the importance of simply protecting wild places for them, for their kids, for their grandkids, for people before us and after us. So that's really our goal, and these kids have um, organized this, and we have four speakers to share those pieces with you. So if you can give us, uh, give the kids anyway, your attention, that would be really awesome. So here we go. Uh, hold on. So the person who is going to tell you about the history of the park is a lifelong Acadia lover, and his name is Bill Horner. His granddaughter, Ellie, is a student here. And Bill is the president of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society, and he's an expert on how this place got to be the way it is, and so he's going to tell you a little story. So come on up, Bill. Our Acadia National Park, Bounty and Beauty. And there was a bang. <laughs> a very, very big bang. And after a while, the great ice came down from the northwest and pushed and scoured and plucked the land. Its great weight sank the land and its enormous mass drew up much of the earth's water and the seas were very, very low. And then the earth began to warm and the great ice melted and the seas reached far into the sunken land. And then the unburdened land was free and rose and great forests grew and man appeared in the beautiful new land. The first native people of the dawn, the Wabanakis, were of the land and traveled with the seasons. They shaped the landscape with fires and harvested the seas and bays and coves of all manner of fish and fowl. Their settlements were temporary and they lived with the bountiful land. They called it Pemetic. A brilliant French navigator, Samuel de Champlain, in 1604, wrote about his first sighting of this place. On September 5, we passed near an island, some four or five leagues long, in the neighborhood of which we just escaped being lost on the rock that was just awash and made a hole in the bottom of our bateau. The island is high and notched in places, so that from the sea it gives the appearance of a range of eight or nine montagnes, 
The summits are all bare and rocky. The slopes are covered with pines and firs and birches. I named it Ile de Mondesert. And the flood of bounty-seeking Euro Europeans began. The first to come were French missionaries, Jesuits, led by Father Pierre Baird. They called the place saint Sever and settled on the western shore of the mouth of the river, today's Somme Sound. And then Captain Argall of the English settlements in Jamestown came in his man-of-war treasurer and blew saint Sever to bits. French and English fought and fought and fought over this land for more than 100 years. Enough, enough already. In 1761, Abraham Soames left Gloucester, Massachusetts with his wife Hannah, four daughters and two cows. They sailed in a Chewbacca boat and settled where there were large, bountiful forests of white oak. They came up the river to a point of land they eventually called Somesville. They set up sawmills and town government and built schooners and caught fish. And James Richardson and others arrived, and villages grew into towns, and they called them Eden and Mount Desert, and Southwest Harbor, and Tremont. In the late 1800s, famous artists such as Thomas Cole and Frederick Church and Fitzhenry Lane came to this island. And where others saw bounty, they saw beauty, sublime, powerful expressions of nature, seascapes and landscapes. They saw a vision in nature that transcended the ordinary usefulness of a bay full of codfish and a forest of trees, and their breathtaking paintings of Mount Desert Island were seen by others who wanted to see this place for themselves. And so came the first wave of tourists, the rusticators, with boundless energy. They were a hardy lot and canoed the bays and lakes, and hiked the mountains and built many paths and trails. They stayed in local people's homes at first, but their numbers grew so quickly that many great ho hotels were built. They included a group of serious, avid students, campers, who called themselves the Champlain Society. They sailed down from Boston on the sloop Sunshine and pitched tents and stayed for several summers on the eastern shore of Sloan Sound where they made detailed observations of the ge geology and flora and fauna of Mount Desert Island. And they kept a journal that was to greatly influence the likes of President Charles W. Eliot of Harvard College and an affluent Bostonian named George Buckman Dorr and John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Yeah. Together, these men led in the creation of what would become Acadia National Park, <laughs> and Mr. Dorr would become the leader of the leaders in this creative act. They were among a group of aristocrats and intellectuals and educators and wealthy socialites who loved to think and discuss, and sail, and play tennis, and have lavish parties. They built huge cottages by the dozens, <laughs> all with splendid views and brilliant landscaping. These summer residents brought bounty to the island as they bought up land and employed local people as builders and gardeners and servants. And they needed shops and livery stables and carpenters and stonemasons and architects and bankers. But they also did something extraordinarily revolutionary. They created an organization called the Hancock County Trustees of Public Reservations, 
whose purpose was to preserve private land for public use. They brought together great minds and men of great wealth and local people with great expertise in the law and in road building. By 1913, they had acquired 5,000 acres of spectacular landscape on Mount Desert Island and offered them to the federal government. In 1916, their offer was accepted and President Woodrow Wilson declared the creation of Sertimal National Monument, later to become Lafayette National Park, and finally, in 1929, Acadia National Park. In that same year, the stock market crashed. <laughs> bringing the Great Depression and a long recovery. But Dorr and Rockefeller and many others continued their great work and expanded the park to include Scooter Peninsula and Isla Ho. And so came automobiles. <laughs> Lots of automobiles. Research laboratories. And despite a great fire of 1947, a new economy with a different kind of summer visitor, with motels and hotels and a pleasure boat building industry and lobster fishing and cruise ships and private jets, all looking for the same things, the beauty and bounty of Acadia National Park. But no one can appreciate this beauty more than we who live here all year round in Acadia's ever-present splendor. We bike. And we walk. And run. And hike. Skateboard. <laughs> nice work, George. And swim. <laughs> and kayak. <laughs> and canoe. Stargaze and photograph and paint and bird watch. And we even get married. celebrate 100 years of 
the history of Acadia, we also must think about the next 100 years. You, tomorrow's stewards of Acadia, have a real challenge. How will you and someday your children and your grandchildren help to preserve and protect the natural beauty and resources of this magnificent place? How can you help to keep its beauty and bounty in balance? You, all of you, with your energy and imagination and intelligence and passion, can and must inspire the next century to care for our beloved park. Her future depends on it. Thank you. Science. Please welcome Abe Miller Brushing. That is an extraordinarily tough act to follow. I won't even attempt to compare. So I'm going to be I'm going to try to transition uh, from that to how um, science uh, helped to create Acadia National Park helps us to continue manage and protect it, and how uh, we need your help to do that, um, to continue the science and to continue to protect Acadia. Um, I'll focus on the stories of three individuals who are not world famous scientists, but who nonetheless their work, uh, both their science and their efforts, in addition to the help of lots of other folks, have really shaped Acadia over the past hundred years of the park. I'm going to start with somebody who you've already met, um, Charles Elliott and the Champlain crew from Harvard. Um, so they wanted to come up, Charles wanted to come up to Acadia uh, for the summer, and he asked his dad, who uh, happened to be the president of Harvard College, uh, and so he said, his dad, Charles Elliott, Charles W. Elliott, said that, uh, yeah, sure, you could take the boat and you can have the camping equipment, but you have to do something useful. So Charles Elliott took him up, brought 13 of his best friends up, set up camp in Northeast Harbor here, and they got to doing work. And so what they decided to do useful along with, so they, just like any college kid, were gonna also did dating and dances and poetry and lots of partying and things like that. But in addition to that, they set up departments, these botany department, botany department, ichthyology department, um, ornithology and whatnot, and started documenting what they saw, just exploring the island. And it didn't take them very long to recognize that not only was the place really beautiful, but it was really valuable to science um, and for research. And so it turned out that later on, um, Charles W. Elliott, the Harvard guy, along with George Dorr and John D. Rockefeller, um, came across the Champlain notebooks and those provided a big part of the inspiration for creating Acadia. Acadia is actually one of the only, and, and maybe the only, national park that has science as a part of the reason it was created. 
So it's right in our founding legislation to preserve this place for its value for the study of, of the geology and flora and fauna. And skipping ahead to Glenn Middlehauser in 1988. So he was, he was a student at College of the Atlantic, and he was inspired both by his uh, major professor, Craig Green, there, who, um, as well as Charles Elliott and the Champlain crew. Uh, he was really interested in documenting nature. And he and Craig uh, worked to start a project to uh, document the flora of Acadia and really understand what is the plant now, what is the plant life now? We knew what it was a hundred years ago when Charles Elliott and that crew was doing their thing, um, but how has it changed? Um, has it changed? And so over the next uh, many years, so what, like 20 years or more, uh, in his spare time, Glenn, while he was going to grad school and dating, getting married, um, having kids, he moved off the grid, started his own business. He kept doing this. He and Craig, uh, he actually, they kept on working on this flora. And in 2005, they actually were able to publish the flora of Acadia um, and documented, well, so they published it in a peer-reviewed literature and they published this field guide. And there was a really big surprise that they came across. So in uh, one out of every five of the plant species that the Champlain guys saw, so back then, are gone. So one out of every five of the species, the plant species that that Charles Elliott and those guys saw um, have disappeared from the park. And this, even though it's been protected over all that time, and it turns, so even though it looks green when you're out there walking around, we have far fewer orchids, far fewer asters, far fewer roses, and other plant species. And so it turns out that Glenn and many other people have followed up on this work and documented lots of other ways that the environment is changing. And so that's really spurred us to, to the park to, do, to take a big change in terms of how we manage Acadia. And I'll transition to this story of Judy Hayes and Connery. And some of you may know her daughter who went here, Erin um, Connery. And this is a picture of Judy when she was here uh, just out of college. She had just graduated and came and started. Um, and she was quick, quite quickly put on a project working on extermination handling invasive species. For those of you who don't know what invasive species are, those are species that non-native, so they're from away, and they displace our native species. So they displace our, our, our local plants and, or disrupt ecosystem processes in different ways. And so we thought, Judy was tasked, hey, you're new, we've got this little problem, we think it'll take about one year to get rid of this purple loosestrife that we have in our wetlands. And Judy started at it and realized, oh, this problem that I thought was an armadillo-sized problem is actually a bit bigger than I thought. And then the more she kept working, the bigger the problem turned out to be, until she realized it was an elephant-sized problem. And, but we didn't have the resources to kind of combat it as an elephant-sized problem. But Judy kept at it. And along the way, the project almost got, uh, we almost cut funding to the project the park did. Um, but Judy had been keeping evidence of the fact that the project was working. We were actually making a difference, decreasing the number of, of invasive species in the park. And I'll mention that climate change is actually a major reason for the invasive species that we have here. Almost all of our major invasive plants are here largely because of the change in climate. Um, but what happened is instead of cutting the project, Judy's evidence that she had been compiling uh, convinced everybody to actually invest more. And so we got a crew and we've actually, so over the past 30 years, we've in, gradually increased the amount of effort we're putting into it. And so we have a crew of five people every summer now working to pull out invasive species. And actually, we this year are starting to transition to maintaining. So we, we're, we've essentially finished getting rid of most of the invasive species. We have small populations here and there. And this is a national success story. There's no other park that has been this successful at getting rid of invasive species east of the Mississippi and probably in the whole country. Nowhere else. And so we really owe a lot of this to Judy. But we still have a lot of problems coming. And so things from fossil fuel emissions, um, 
And even though this one is from Indonesia, even these fossil fuel emissions from far away have effects here. And these effects can be in terms of visibility, we have warming temperatures, the temperature, the change in temperature we're expecting over the next 80 years or so is the same change in temperature that there has been since there was a mile of ice standing on top of us. So even though these changes in temperature don't sound like a lot, it's a big difference. We have more extreme, um, extreme rainfall events. We have a longer growing season, a much shorter winter. So, and this is affecting every single one of the activities that you saw up here earlier is being affected by these changes. And it's forcing us in the national park to really change how we manage our parks and it's forcing us to need, we need a lot of new science because what we thought we were managing is a thing that was unchanging and now we need science to under, more science to understand the changes, how they're impacted, what the consequences of those changes are, and how we can best respond. We'll skip this slide. And so what we need, in, oh, yeah, there we go. So we'll, um, what we need is, we need lots more science than we've ever had before. And we need not only professional scientists, but we need, um, we, so not only professionals, but we also need citizen science, we need volunteers, we need community involvement. And so we need folks, like more folks, to be inspired by um, Charles Elliott, by Glenn Middlehauser, by Judy Hayes and Connery, and others, and to follow up on their work. And so I hope that some of you go on to become professional scientists that help us understand how the world is changing and how we ought to be able to manage it. And I hope, but you don't have to become a professional. You can contribute through citizen science and you can tr contribute through other volunteer efforts. Um, Paige Steele, who I'll introduce here in a second, can help, will introduce you to some of the opportunities. Um, but you can also, for those of you who are interested in working for the National Park Service, which is we're just one place where you can go to work to do this kind of stuff, you can Google NPS jobs for students and find out how to get a career and what kinds of careers there are in the National Park Service, including summer internships and things like that. Um, but I absolutely encourage you to get involved. We absolutely need it. And it's not a joke. It's not cliche. Uh, although it sounds, it, it's, it's absolutely honest to God truth. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just transition over here to Paige Steele, who's the, um, from Friends of Acadia. And the concert, she's their conservation projects manager. And she's going to talk about more ways that you can get involved, including some of the ways that you can get involved with science and management with the park. Thanks so much. doing today? Good. Good. Great. All right. Well, just to start out, I just want to give you a little bit of my background. And I came from Oklahoma. That's where I was raised. And so there's a lovely picture of the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, which is a host to bison and another, other unusual creatures that don't live up here, such as the armadillo, like, um, like they mentioned and um, other, some other great creatures. And so there's also a picture of Mary Oxley Nature Center up there. And before I came up to Maine uh, to go to College of the Atlantic, I did some community college back home, and I was able to volunteer as a naturalist there, and it was a really great way to connect with my community and learn, um, meet different people, learn about the ecosystem, and just connect with the kids as well. And um, so then I came up to Maine and Went to College of the Atlantic, married a man from Maine, stayed up here, uh, got married on top of Cadillac Mountain, and uh, just had my son in um, Bar, or in Bar Harbor at the MDI Hospital. So Acadia National Park's been the backdrop for my adult life so far. So it's a very special place. And uh, the Acadia community wants to connect you to their work and education and volunteer opportunities. And this is your community. You grew up here, and it is the backdrop to your entire life. And so there's a lot of things that you can do. You can join NPS um, internships and jobs um, and volunteering. But then um, the budget can only take you so far with the National Park Service. And so they have friends groups to help them out, which is where Friends of Acadia comes in. And so we help support a lot of youth and volunteer programs in the park to um, expand our reach in the community. 
So a big goal for the park and for Friends of Acadia is to do youth engagement. And we want to create really long-term opportunities so you guys can get out there, whether it's through field trips or outdoor classrooms where you're doing your studies in the park or through jobs or volunteering. We wanted to get you out there not for more than just a day and really experience your park and take some ownership over it. And we want to create a stepping stone to conservation jobs. And you guys are in a generation where conservation is going to be a part of the rest of your life uh, on a daily way, whether you're recycling or whether you're working in science or the arts or if you're living in a city or in the country. It's going to be a huge part of the rest of your life and how it affects, affects your daily life. So, um, and then, of course, we want to grow the stewards of tomorrow. And whether that's just you know, getting out for a couple of days a year or being a regular part of a, of a conservation project in our public lands, we want you guys to help take care of them because they, they're yours. And let's go to the next slide. So a couple of um, employment opportunities is we have the Acadia Youth Conservation Corps. And many of you here today have participated in this program. And it's a group of 16 youth that get out and work on trails and carriage roads throughout the park with um, MPS employees and leaders. And you guys do a huge amount of work um, in trail and rehab and restoration. So um, Deerbrook Trail and Astaku Trail that were just recently rehabbed were done by AYCC. We also have the Acadia Youth Technology Team, which is only about five years old, and they've been working on visitor experiences. If you had the privilege of getting over to the Peregrine Watch in the last few years, hopefully you got to experience the new digital media interpretive kit that this team put together to help visitors get to see the Peregrines in real time versus having to wait in a line for 30 minutes to look through a periscope, I mean a telescope. And, um, this year they're going to be working on videography and photography for the centennial. And then we have some college level programs called uh, Calix Summit Stewards, the Recreation Technician, and Ridge Runners. We also have a Wild Gardens intern, um, but they aren't for as long as these positions are. And these positions all work with visitor use and management and resource management. And so they're helping visitors find their way on the trails. They're doing data collection um, to find out how many people are using a trail or carriage road section of the park. Um, they're telling people uh, where to go, um, restoring cairns to keep people on the trail, um, telling people about leave no trace and what that means and how to protect the park while they're visiting it and um, just having a really good time interacting with the visitors, hiking, um, some sitting with doing data collection, but it's very important to have eyes and ears out on the ground um, to report back to the park service to help with their management. And then we have a lot of volunteer opportunities. These are just the ones that Friends of Acadia really sponsors, um, but there's many more in the park um, at uh, Ilaho, MDI, and Scudic that you can get involved with. And so two of our big programs are the Katie Winter Trails Association, and if any of you guys like snowshoeing or um, cross-country skiing, or even walking your dog in the wintertime, it's thanks to these guys and girls. And they get out and we have um, snowmobiles that the park uses and takes care of, and the groomers get out and uh, groom and flatten the trails and keep them really nice for your use in the wintertime. And if uh, any of you guys are riders or you want to become a rider, we could uh, take on some high schoolers for this program if you're interested in snowmobiling um, on the weekends to help groom. Last year we needed a lot of help. Um, and then we have our stewardship volunteers and they are just wonderful. They get out and work on the trails and carriage roads from the springtime into the fall and it's a drop-in program. You don't need to sign up or um, bring tools or anything. You can just get out there and show up at headquarters and go work on for three hours in the morning and help out. There's also big events like um, the Earth Day Roadside Cleanup and Take Pride in Acadia Day. So the last um, opportunity is you guys can be a mentor. You guys might have a younger sibling or a cousin or a neighbor who is excited about getting in the park, but they want to. They don't really want to go with their parents, but maybe they'll want to go with you. And you guys could take them out to do Acadia Quest, um, which is a really fun scavenger, experiential scavenger hunt in the park. And this year. It's the centennial version, so it's talking about the past and the future of the park. And then we also, of course, have our volunteer programs that you guys could take um, a young person to to get them experience, 
have a good experience in the park. And um, so you, to learn more about our programs, you can go to our website. We have a lot more details about all our programs. The job announcements go up usually in January. And our volunteer programs, like I said, run, uh, run year round. And we also have a lot of intern blogs that people have written about their experiences. And so you can read a little bit about that to find out more information. And if you have any more questions, please contact me. And then um, last but not least, I'd like you guys to take 30 seconds to turn to your neighbor and think about how you can get involved with Acadia in the future. And start now. All right, well thank you guys, and we really hope that you get involved in whatever way you think is most meaningful for you. At this time, I'd like to introduce the president and my friend, David McDonald, and he's the president of Friends of Acadia. Thank you, Paige. Thanks for all of you for hanging in here. The clock ticking down to lunch, I know. Uh, so I've got the biggest topic in the shortest amount of time, so um, I'll try to move right along. Um, as Paige said, um, David McDonald, uh, lucky enough to be president of Friends of Acadia, a job I've been in for about four years. Um, about 34 years ago, I was sitting where you're sitting, I went to MBI High School, graduated in 1982. So um, very lucky to have lived here most of my life and, and found my way back here. Um, when I was Applying to colleges, I was sure I wanted to get out of Maine. I did get out of Maine. I came back pretty quickly. Uh, lived in southern Maine for a couple of years, but it really was not the same. Um, having places to hang out on the shore, hike, uh, be outdoors, be climbing mountains without giving a thought to who owned the land or whether I could access it or not, that is not the case down in southern Maine. And so, lo and behold, I'm back here. And I've, I've lived here for about the last 25 years and uh, worked in the conservation field. So I feel very, very lucky. But honestly, I love my job, but um, I would love nothing more than in the not too distant future to have one of you up here in my shoes. Um, not just speaking to the assembly, but running Friends of Acadia. Um, we truly need your generation to be uh, not sort of passengers on the bus, but driving the bus for the next 100 years. So I'm glad you're here. I know you don't have a choice about being here, but um, it's been a great show and, and you're a very important audience to all of us. So how to speak to the importance of conserving wild places. Um, this, this is a huge topic, we could spend a long time on it. I'm just gonna tell you what they mean to me because personally I think it comes down to a personal level. Uh, there's a ton of research, a growing body of literature really about how Time outdoors in particular, doesn't matter if it's a national park or a local park or your backyard or a big tract of wilderness. Um, time outdoors is very important for your mental health, your well-being, your weight, um, your happiness, your stress level. Um, all of it is only becoming more important um, as you guys get older, go to college, get into the workforce. The overwhelming um, uh, presence of technology, media, 24-7 connectivity, it's great. It, it's, a, it's a blessing, but it's also a curse. And, and the role that places like this play is only becoming more important, I feel. So um, in, in talking about wilderness or thinking about it, there have been many, many people who have written about it, some really famous quotes. You see them on inspirational posters. You see them in books. I was skimming through them um, uh, planning for this chat, and none of them really hit home. Um, I found one that was a book written by a kid about your age, actually. Um, a couple of brothers who were teenagers out west doing a lot of rambling around, rafting and hiking uh, out in the parks out in California and uh, Nevada. So I just want to read uh, the first few lines from that book and then comment why they hit home for me. I don't know if they will for you. But uh, Jerry and Rennie Russell wrote this book called On the Loose. It's a really short book of photos and writing, but it talked about their time out in the wilderness. So the book begins, 
Have you ever walked 34 miles on a dirt road in the desert with only a jar of rusty water to drink because you expected someone else who didn't come and then you walked past your turn off in the dark? Have you ever dropped your sleeping bag in the ocean by mistake? Have you ever slept on a sand dune on a windy night and then spit sand all the next day? Have you ever walked 234 miles of mountain trail to see how fast you could do it? Have you ever burned your blue jeans trying to dry them on a wood stove after getting caught out in a blizzard on the trail? Have you ever had a cheese sandwich for Christmas dinner in Death Valley? Have you ever camped in a dump? Have you ever gone to sleep on a beach and woken up in the water and almost lost your shoes and glasses to the tide? Have you ever lain under a truck for six hours because it was the only shade in the desert in July? No, I reckon not all of them maybe, but that's how we've grown up, my brother and I. That and a thousand little glimmers on the water, a thousand red streaks in the sundown sky, and a thousand puffs going up the trail. Everybody goes about it differently, of course, but I don't guess that we trade any of it. Most important is an imperishable attitude, a philosophy, if you like, a way of laying out the world and planting ourselves in it. Now we know what is trivial and what is real. We are crazy kids out on the loose, but on the loose in the wilderness, and that makes all the difference. Now, Rennie Russell died uh, a couple years after writing this book in a, in a rafting accident out west. But what I love about the book is these guys are on the loose. Again, they're not in an intern program. They're not volunteering for the park. They're just outdoors, as, as my parents used to say, just dubbing around. And that was really the way I spent most of my time here in Acadia growing up. Um, I was not a model of citizen stewardship in the park. Uh, maybe I get to Sand Beach now and then, but mostly I was just hanging out at the bluffs on Echo Lake, running some of the trails out back here in the high school, and I was on the track team. But that time outside, although it wasn't structured, better yet that it wasn't structured, it really did shape who I was, and it seeped into my bones and my blood. And after a few years away at school and living in Southern Maine, I really, really had to come back. Um, and, and growing up here, believe it or not, turned out to be a huge benefit for me, actually. You don't know how many people say to me, someone in the role you're in at Friends of Acadia, it's really, really great and important that it's someone who grew up here. And um, so I can't say enough about the park, how it shaped my life. Um, and I guess I would say to you, I know that you're living in a world that's actually much more complex than when I was a kid. Um, I know that from my two teenagers. I know it from talking to some of you. Uh, the pressures you're under are different. They're very great, but I think it only increases the importance of, of wilderness and places like Acadia and just getting out and, and dubbing around. It doesn't have to be through a structured program. If you have that interest in time, God bless you. We would welcome that at Friends of Acadia in the park. But even more important is the unstructured time out in the woods, out on the shore, just, just messing around with your friends. It's, you, you won't know how important it is till later on. Um, so, whether it's a patch of woods out your back door, whether it's a huge tract of wilderness out west, uh, get out and enjoy it, and in particular, Acadia, we not only have this beautiful place, a national park, it's our home. And for many of us, that's the more important bond, but you, you put the two of those together, and it's a very unique relationship. So, uh, to close out, uh, we're gonna see Will Green's film. Um, it says without any words what all of us have been trying to convey, so thanks for your time, thanks for your attention. And um, uh, appreciate the Honor Society putting together this assembly. Thank you. So, yeah, now we're going to show Will Green's film. Uh, if you don't know, Will graduated last year and was a part of NHS. Um, this film just really displays the amazing wonders of Acadia and personally just makes me feel special um, to call this place home. Uh, or lucky, I should say. So I hope you guys enjoy.